the new color calibration module works as a supplement to the legacy white balance module. Why? Well, so glad you asked. That's what we're going to cover in this episode. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 83 of Understanding Dark Table. As mentioned uh, in last episode, the color calibration module has these two personalities. On one hand, it works as a replacement for the channel mixer, and on the other hand, it works as a supplement to the legacy white balance module. Now, why do we need two different tools that do white balancing work on our image? Well, part of it comes down to where the legacy white balance module falls in the pixel pipe. If you look at the active modules, you will see that it is the second step after the raw black and white point gets set. And it happens prior to demosaic. And it has to happen before demosaicing because if the white balance isn't set properly, then the demosaicing tool doesn't work properly. And there are reasons why all of these modules fall in the order that they fall in within the pixel pipe. And because the legacy white balance module happens so early in the pixel pipe, one of the downsides is, and I've already covered this in the new features video, we don't get the ability to work with masks on the legacy white balance module because it's just way too early in the pipe. So one of the key advantages of the new color calibration module is the fact that we do get the ability to work with masks. And as you saw me demonstrate in the new features video where I mentioned the color calibration module, where that comes in handy is when you have an image that has different light temperature sources within the one image. If there are, you know, varying light sources, then you've got all these different white balances competing within the one image. And being able to use masks means that we can then process different parts of an image to treat the white balance for, you know, just a section of that composition. That's a massive step forward because we've never had that previously. And it is something I will give them credit for this, that Adobe introduced to Lightroom probably about, I'm going to say four or five years ago now. In fact, it might even have been longer. It might have been earlier than that. I don't know. So it is great to now have that ability in Darktable. For this sample uh, image, I have grabbed this image from the Church of St. Mary Magdalene at René Le Chateau in France. Uh, I, I just love the mood of this image. So, as you would have heard me say in episode 82, the legacy white balance modules had a bit of an overhaul. We now have these four new buttons. And if in preferences and processing and auto apply chromatic adaptation defaults, you have chosen modern, then what you are saying to Darktable is turn on the legacy white balance module, set it to D65 or camera reference, and then turn on the color calibration module as well. So first up, we've got the chromatic adaptation transform tab and the adaptation dropdown has a very handy pop-up tooltip there that you can read. It describes all of the adaptation variations and basically it defines the color space that the module will work in. Uh, generally, you're going to be working with one of the first three. Aurelian said, don't worry about X, Y, Z. It's really just there for testing. None will essentially bypass the adaptation and use the color calibration module in whatever working color space you have for your pipeline. And for most of us, that's going to be Linear Rec 2020 RGB. If we choose, say, Linear Bradford, the Illuminant will be set to whatever the module believes is the nearest match for the particular image. 
in this instance, it has said custom because it's brought up this CCT is correlated color temperature. So if it has come up as showing as invalid, uh, the module's basically thrown up its hands and gone, I don't know, you work it out. So we can choose an illuminant from the range of options here. So we can say, same as the pipeline, not sure why it says D50 when the white balance module says camera reference is most likely D65, above my pay grade. Okay, so we can choose incandescent, which will balance it for an incandescent globe. We can choose daylight. We can choose equi energy. I have no idea what equi energy is. Fluorescent, LED. And you'll notice that for each of these options, you get different uh, options here. Wow. So you can choose different types of fluorescent lighting. Wow. That is cool, Aurelian. That is really cool, dude. Nice. Uh, Equi Energy, I have no idea what that is. LED is obviously LEDs. So presumably if you're dealing with artificial lighting that was LED in nature, you can match the particular type of light source. Or we can go for detect from image surfaces in which case the module will basically look at the entire image and go, I think it's 5006 Kelvin. Or we can choose detect from image edges. And in that instance, it will look at the edges of, you know, objects where there is sharp sort of contrast, where it expects to find gray and then use that as a white balancing mechanism. Or we can choose as shot in camera. And that was obviously 5,112 Kelvin. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the great advantage of the color calibration module is the fact that we can now work with masks. So if for some reason I wanted to, let's say, keep all of the warmth in this bottom right-hand corner of the image, but then cool down the rest of the image, I could do exactly that you know, with a drawn mask or I could use parametric masks if I wanted to. But let's say I wanted to just do something absolutely crazy like that. Using my shift key, I could have a nice wide fall off. And so now I've kept that white balance where I want it. I could now middle click on this icon to introduce a second color calibration module. I could then choose to set this for incandescent, say if I wanted to really cool down that background, and then I could choose a raster mask and tell it use the mask I used from the previous color calibration module, but invert it. And as we can see, there's a bit of a, a sharp fall off between the two, but you hopefully understand the concept. We've been able to work with different white balance for different areas of the one image. That's something we've not had before, and I think it's fantastic. Uh, yes, you would certainly go and modify those masks and make the transition a little less obvious, but I love that ability now. That's great. Okay, beyond that, we also have, let me just get rid of this second uh, module because we don't really want to do that. And I'll turn the masking off on the first one. The gamut compression slider. Basically, if we turn on our clipping indicators and if I right click on them, we set clipping mode to saturation only we can see that all of these pixels that are bright red, they are deemed to be out of gamut. In other words, the saturation is too much for the color space that we want to output to at the end of the pipeline. And what the gamut compression slider will do is start to pull the saturation back on the 
pixels which are closest to white and which are most saturated. Now, it will also impact pixels which are currently valid because you don't want a hard clip. You, you want the transition to be softened and so even some valid pixels will be modified when you crank up this gamut compression slider. But the pixels that are further out of gamut will be modified more than the pixels which were currently valid. And when you then turn the clipping indicators off, we can see that the overall saturation of the image has been reduced from where it was. My understanding of this is that that is really there for if you know you want to output this image onto a medium, but you know, certainly things like printer paper that may not be able to display the range of colors and saturations that your computer monitor is capable of representing. That's where this becomes particularly handy because you can pull that gamut back into line before you actually try and print the image so that the stuff that is out of gamut doesn't look like just blobs of solid color when it's printed on paper. That's my understanding. Clip negative RGB from gamut essentially means anything below black will simply be clipped to black. I don't know what other option you had. If it was beyond black, it was going to be black anyway. So I'm not sure exactly what that is doing to the pixels in your image. Seriously, I have recorded this video about six times and I'm... I still don't know whether I've done this module justice. I feel like there's too much I don't understand. Uh, hopefully I've at least covered the basics and got you up and running with it. I do like it for if, for, if for no other reason than the ability to mask and to deal with different white balances within a single image. I think that's a, a great leap forward. All right, guys, questions, comments, feedback, please sing out down below. Uh, Aurelian, if I've misrepresented anything, please set me straight in the comments down below. Um, yeah, but hopefully this has been helpful. Alrighty, is there anything else I needed to cover? I don't think so. Honestly, there are so many things that I've covered in the various attempts to record this video that I don't know what I've actually included in this particular version and what I have not. I'm hoping I mentioned it, but I came across a thread on photo.net which uh, discusses this idea of what an illuminant is and its role within photographic processing in the digital realm. Uh, I will put a link to that particular thread in the description down below as well as to the thread that Aurelian has recently started on pixels.us where he's talking about color spaces and yeah that sort of addresses the color calibration module as well all right guys that is going to do it for this episode uh, questions comments feedback sing out down below and I will answer whatever I can but that probably won't be a whole lot all right I'm going to leave it there. I will catch you in the next one.